All right, so why is it impossible for the 4% rule to work as the 4% rule as we've been told to, to follow? It's, it's just it's inherently impossible. All right, so Bill Bangin, I love the guy. I've never met him, but I'm, he, I follow him all the time. He's always uh, commenting on advisor perspectives. He writes articles, big fan, long time, first time. Uh, he started the ball rolling, actually, as somebody else he cited in his Journal for Financial uh, Planning article from 1994. He gave uh, uh, credos to somebody else. I forgot who the other person was. But the point being was that we have a linear, everyone is saying we got a linear rate of return of, we'll just say 10% a year. 10% each and every year the markets go up, thus we should be able to take 6% a year uh, without even touching capital uh, principal and actually adding 4% a year capital. So. 10% average rate of return, we take 6% a year out, we get 4% added back to principal. That was, for a long time, that's what people thought. It was stupid. Bill Bain said, no, that doesn't work because there's volatility in the markets. And sometimes the market goes up 30, sometimes it goes down 20. If you're using this linear rate of return and modeling your distributions based on a linear rate of return, inherently, that you can't do that. You're gonna run out of money. And so he showed, with his 4% rule, that the safe withdrawal rate, the maximum you could take out on an inflation-adjusted basis, and I'm not going to get into that here because I've done that before many times, an inflation-adjusted basis to avoid running out of money would be 4%. Trinity came back in 1997, the Trinity study from San Antonio, that says about 4.4 when you had small caps, international, things of that nature. So we still have 4 or 4.5% was a safe withdrawal rate. The amount of money you could take out on an annualized basis adjusted for inflation to have never run out of money using historical data. But what was Bill Bangin using? Well, he was using 60, 50 or 60. I guess we'll say 50%. I, always, I think it was 60, 40, right? Maybe it's 50, 50. It doesn't matter. We'll just say 50, 50. 50% S&P 500 with 50% 10-year intermediate treasury bonds. All right, government 10-year treasury bonds. That's what he was using. Now, the problem with that is, let's show you how bonds actually work. So we're going to go over here because I think a lot of people don't understand this, which, is, which frustrates me. All right, so if we're using 10-year treasury bonds, I'm gonna point to right here for the time being. And we're buying a bond today at $1,000. All right, can you all see that? Yeah, all right. The bond matures at $1,000, all right? We're buying a bond at 1,000, the bond matures at 1,000. I don't think, no one should debate this. This is exactly how bonds work. We get a 4% coupon, all right? So if we have $1,000 in that bond, we're getting $40 a year for 10 years, all right? That's it, man. You're not getting any more, not getting any less. The government bond is a risk-free bond, so as such, we know we're gonna put a thousand in, we're gonna get a thousand back, in this case is a 10-year, and boink, and boink. And so we'll get 400 of interest, plus our thousand dollars back. It's literally that simple, that's it, all right. So what Bill Bang and, and, and others at all were using and have done, I mean, not just Bill, but many people have used, is they use that rate of return, that 4% on the 10-year treasuries, but they use it wrongly, wrongly. Because what happens if I'm getting a $40 coupon, a 4% coupon, I'm getting $40 a year in interest. What happens if interest on, on newly issued bonds increases to 6%? Let me erase this. All right, so what happens now, I'm stuck, there we go. All right, so now we're gonna say we're two years in, all right? So now we have a, we're two years in, we have eight years left on this bond. Eight years, we're still getting a 4% coupon. Eight years left. Now again, I put $1,000 in initially. All right, so I'm getting $40. All right, you see how that works. So I got 320 yet to get. That's what I'm gonna get left. Now a new bond comes out, a new 10-year bond is paying 6%, all right? So now it's paying $60 a year, and then it matures at 1,000. So here I'm getting $600. Now I have an extra two years, I grant you, but it's, we can even use it in eight year. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because what happens is now I'm getting 50% uh, more in income at $600, $60 a year than I was at the 4% coupon. That's 50% more in income each and every year on this new bond. Now in this case, it's a 10-year bond, so I have two more years which to hold it. 
So it's going to make it, uh, there is more longevity risk to some regard or more inflation risk or to be honest with you, more deflation protection either way. So there's not all apples to apples, but even if this was an eight-year bond, an eight, let's just say the government issued eight-year bonds at 5%, it's still worth more than this bond right here, right? So here I'm only getting $40. Here I'm getting $60, which inherently means if I wanted to sell this bond, would someone pay me 1000 for it when they could turn around and buy a, a 10-year bond at 6%? No, they're going to pay me less than 1000 nope. In this case, we'll just say they pay me 800 bucks. So they pay me 800 bucks. I'm still getting a 4% coupon, but I'm only gonna get, if I have to sell this, I'll get less money than what I will get at maturity. Why? Because the prevailing interest rates have gone up. This is so flippin' important. You cannot avoid this by buying mutual funds. You cannot avoid this by buying, it, you, bonds work like simple arithmetic, my friends. There is no escaping this fundamental concept. If interest rates go up, the price of my bond goes down. Now, the only thing I can do, I can sell it or I can keep it. If I sell it, I'm just going to say the price goes down to $800. Now, I can buy $800. I, can, well, I can't really buy one bond, but just say I could. I could buy a six, uh, a 10-year bond that's paying, six, that's paying $60 a year, right? So I could buy a 10-year bond. Let's erase this for my $800. So I say, man, I don't like that $40 anymore. And look, I'm just pulling this out of my butt how much I could get for it. And there's a simple mathematic concepts here. But now I got eight. So I sell this at eight hundred dollars because I do not like the forty dollars a year in interest anymore. So now I'm going to buy an eight. Oops. Now I'm going to buy a ten year bond at eight hundred bucks. And again, I couldn't do that. But just for simplicity, you can't buy a partial bond. It's got to be the whole thing. I'm getting six percent now. So now I'm getting forty eight dollars, forty eight dollars, forty eight dollars. You see what I'm saying? Until it matures at eight hundred bucks. All right. That may or may not be worth it. That may or may not be worth it, depending on if I need the income immediately or if I want to take a hit on the back end because I sold it at a, a, a lower value. That's how bonds work. It is not what the, oops, excuse me there, big boy. It is not what the 4% rule and stuff would say that I get 4%. For, so in 1960, the 10 year paid 4.7. Let me use, look at this. Even though we got high class, High class, my new whiteboard, I'm still using my marker, the PVC pipe that says top. All right, so this is still my, uh, my marker, my pointer. All right, so the 10-year bond pays 4.7, right? I'm getting that for all of 10 years. I cannot get that one year and something else the next year and something else the next year. I can't. The 10-year bond next year pay 3.8. Right, so I'm getting 4.7, while the newly issued bonds only pay 3.8. So in this case, I'm doing better than the newly issued bonds. However, the 10-year bond the next year is 4.1, 3.8, 4.2, 4.2, 4.6, 4.6, 5.5, 5.5. .5. So the interest rates have gone up, and now I'm still getting 4.7 or $47 per every thousand invested. However, I'm not getting $55 here because the new bonds are paying 5.5. And the following year, when this guy matures, I'm getting $60. So in this case, is a good thing. One, two, yeah, 10 years. So 10 years, this guy matures at 4.7. So I was able to miss out on these lower interest rate bonds uh, simply because I bought a bond when the interest rates are higher. And then I can turn around and trade it in for this bond right here at 7.8. So I am freaking loving life, happy as a clam. Absolutely, I am. Ooh, that, ooh, that rhymes. So Dr. Seuss, I should be banned. I'm happy as a clam. Absolutely, I am. Take that, uh, cancel culture. So now I trade this 4.7 pawn, I'm getting 7.8. So whereas before, I started getting $47 for every $1,000 invested. Now I'm getting $78 for every $1,000 invested. So it sounds like I'm in good shape, right? Except for the fact, what if I started here at 3.8? What if I started in 1961? I'm getting 38, where prevailing bonds are 41, 38, 42, 42, 46, 46, 45, 60, 78, and now I'm reinvesting this at 6.2. But Bill Banyan and these guys, they say, no, you're gonna get this at, you're gonna get this one year, this and next, this and next, and that's not how bonds work. It's not how bonds work. You cannot say this is a, uh, a, a every year it changes out the interest rate. It does not change out unless you take the value of the bond itself and you sell it each and every year. In this case, you get a premium, right? In this case, you get a, a 
a discount because the interest rates went up. In this case, you get another premium. In this case, you get another discount. In this case, it's still the same. In this case, you get another discount because the interest rates went up. Another discount, another discount, another discount. You cannot sell, I mean, you can, but you can't use 10-year treasury bonds to calculate your rate of return on an annual basis. It doesn't make sense. It cannot work. And so now we say, okay, so now I'm watching at seven, seven, $78 per every uh, $1,000 if I started in 1960. But remember, Bill Bengen's in the Trinity study, they're using a 4% rule to say the safe withdrawal rate, and they're using this every year. So one time you retired in 1960, one time you retired in 1961. If you retired in 1961, we'll say you got 3.8 the first year on the 10-year treasury, then we're gonna say you got 4.1. That's not true, that's not true. You did not get 4.1 the second year. You only got 3.8. All right, so now I retired in 1961. Fast forward to when this bond matures. It matures right here, so now I'm gonna get 6.2. 6.5, 7, 7.5, 7.7, 7.2. So by the time this guy matures, if I have to sell this guy here, I'm taking a big loss, 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 loss. And by the time it matures, look at this, man, 7.7. I was only getting 6.2. So five years into my $62 per $1,000 investment, I am getting, I'm missing out on 77, 72, 80, 91 dollars. I'm missing out on that because I'm essentially locked into the 6.2% interest rate unless I decide to sell it. And because the interest rates are going up, I will sell it for a discount like I showed you over here, right over there, where if you're selling a bond when interest rates went up, you're going to have to sell it for a discount. So what he should have done is use the one month because the one month I'm just using on an annual basis. This rotates every month. So in this case, in 1960, I guess the average was 2.7, 2.1, 2.7, 2.3 point one. So you can see, lower, 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 a little bit higher, lower, lower, a little bit higher, lower, 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 higher, higher, lower, 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 and higher. So you can see the 10-year treasury outperformed the one month significantly, as it should be, because you should get better interest rates the longer you hold your money, uh, the longer you lock in your money. That's, they have to pay you to reward you for your patience, essentially. So he should not have used a 10-year. He should have used a one month. And if you used the one month, the 4% four rule is, is blown into freaking smithereens anyway. Because instead of saying I got 4.7 in 1960, I'm only getting 2.7. Instead of saying I'm getting 3.8 the following year, I'm only getting 2.1. Because you cannot change out your bonds, your 10-year bonds, as if you have the same amount of principal. It doesn't work like that. Secondly, now what, and again, this isn't to bash anybody. It's just to say, no, I can't believe no one's thinking about it. This is crazy. Secondly, uh, <laughs> so a lot of people say, well, if you just took out 4% a year, well, you, you still have to dip into principal. Because right here, I'm only getting 2.7 or I'm getting 3.8. Either way, um, you, and, and going into the 1980s and 1990s, you aren't getting 4% on 10-year treasuries. Certainly not now. So if you're not getting 4% in yield, what has to happen? You cannot sell your bond and get a portion of it. Now, you can live off the interest, I grant you. That is true. But you... <laughs> You can't say, hey, sell you know, 10 you know, percent of my bond and, and keep another 90% in there. It doesn't work like that. Bonds don't work. You cannot take uh, uh, not let you, you have to sell the whole thing or nothing. You cannot just sell a proportion amount of the bond that you need for income. It doesn't work like that. And by the way, when you reinvest the interest, you're reinvesting at the falling rates. You're not reinvesting into that same bond either. I, this is another thing that drives you up the wall. Bonds, you can't reinvest in bonds. It doesn't work like that. Bonds that pay you your income. You spend it or you reinvest in something else, but you're not reinvesting in that same bond. So I'm getting 4.7. I'm not reinvesting in that, 4 point, that $47 on 1,000 into a 4.7 bond. It's not. The following year, I get 3.8 if I reinvest into a brand new bond. It, 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 it's just it's silly. Anyway, so what happens here? If I'm taking 4% a year, and I'm, on my bonds, I'm only getting 3.8, inherently, I have to pull from my principal. I don't have enough in the bond to pay. Now, I do have 50% in the stock market, I grant you. But is that being reflected in the 4% rule? No, no, it's not. He's just taking 4%. He's saying, I have 100,000 in my portfolio. The first year, the markets went up 20. Uh, so I have 120,000 in my portfolio. I'm taking 4% from that. You can't do it like that. You have to say how much of that, and so let's go to 1973 and 1974. 73 and 74, stocks got killed, all right, down 44% in total. These bonds did fine. So there's no way I'm taking 4% on my portfolio from 73 and 74. It's all coming from the bonds. 
Now, thankfully, these bonds paid the 4% that I needed, but if we adjust for inflation, are these bonds keeping up with the high inflation that we had? No. So even though they're paying 7, uh, 6.9, 6.5, 8, and 7, after we started in 1960, that's not keeping up with inflation. That's paying $80 on a $1,000 investment. All right, from 1960 to 1973, we had inflation, I don't, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, about 4%. That's compounding. This right here only paid me, uh, uh, let's say that's about what, three times, three times more than my one month treasury. This right here, the 10 year, only paid me less than half increase on my, on my uh, 10 year treasury, which means there's no way that that is keeping up with inflation. Now as such, while it says 6.5 looks pretty doggone good, it doesn't look good if I started here because bonds don't compound. Uh, anyway, I hope this helps. There's no way the four, it's impossible for the 4% rule to work the way it's concocted. It just is. Stop using it. Yeah, it just, it doesn't make sense. It's like, the, this is why I argue about the mass all the time. Well, science changes. Okay, well, financial planning changes too. But the 4% rule is proven by Trinity, by Bill Bangin. Yeah, things change, man. Knowledge changes, knowledge increases. Don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out, but don't be so closed-minded that you're stuck in freaking 1920s financial planning dogma. You wake up, man. Wake up. So what do you do instead? Well, that's what this whole channel is about. What do you do instead? And we talk about it all the time. I'm not going to share this because we're already at 16 minutes. We'll love to hear your thoughts. Thanks now.